Good morning, classrooms. Hello, everyone. Today's Scientist in Every Florida School live stream event. Uh, we're bringing you genetics with the University of Florida's Genetics Institute. We've got a lot of exciting guests with us on uh, screen today, and we're going to get straight to it. But first, we wanted to remind you that the chat box is a great place to add any questions that you have for any of the team on the call today, and we'll be sure to get to those questions shortly. We also encourage you to take a look at a couple of links that are being placed in the chat box as well, uh, including a worksheet to follow along with middle school as well as one for high school. So I think we're gonna go ahead and get things kicked off here. As promised, exciting genetics concepts for today. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Samantha Brooks. She's going to tell us a little bit about herself and introduce the rest of the team with us on the call. Thank you. Hello, hello students and teachers. Welcome Lee County Schools. I wish you could be here with us today on the University of Florida campus. I know it doesn't look like it, maybe it doesn't look like a lab where you would meet a bunch of geneticists, but we do so many exciting things with genetics at the uh, UF Genetics Institute. I didn't want to talk about just what I do, but talk about all the wonderful things that we do across the Institute. So we have got a whirlwind jam-packed virtual field trip for you. So my name is Dr. Samantha Brooks. I am a professor here and um, I use genetics to study large animals like my friend Patty here, Patty the horse. I'll talk a little bit more about him when my turn comes around, but for now I'm going to turn it over to our team. So I brought with me five more scientists to talk to you guys about genetics. So it includes our academic specialist, Dr. Brittany Hollister, and four of our fantastic graduate students. So before we get into some of our example research studies, I'm going to hand you over to Luke Chandler, who's going to tell you a little bit of a review on basic genetics and show you how he uses genetics in his research. Uh, all right. Hi, Stu. Um, so yeah, I'm Luke Chandler. Uh, I'm working on my PhD here at UF, and uh, I use genetics to, to study very small animals. Um, so I'll, I'll be showing you a little bit about that in a bit, but first I wanted to show you guys the uh, <clears throat> some basics, some words that you guys have probably already learned, and and just kind of orient you guys to, to what this uh, what what genetics is all about. Um, so this is just a short little clip, a video clip that I'm going to kind of walk you through a little. So this is just a cell. You know, you guys are probably learning about this and if you're starting to take biology and there's some common terms that you guys know, you know, membrane is the enclosure, um, cytoplasm, it's just the fluid within the cell and, you know, that good old powerhouse of the cell there. Um, and, and yeah, if you don't know these terms, that's fine. You know, maybe you'll learn about them in, in, in the near future far future, who knows, and, uh, but anyway, so the nucleus, that's where I'm going to hone in, so that's where the, uh, the actual genes are located, so every cell has these nucleus, and genes are stretched in these long lines of chromatin, and they're wrapped around proteins that, uh, you know, condenses them and makes them fit in that tiny little space, but when you unwind them, what you get is a huge strand of, of DNA that has several of these little gene locations, so here's a little picture kind of walking you through what that video just showed. You know, every animal, every living thing has cells. You can zoom in and find them. And that those little red dots within, within the cell category, those are the nucleuses. And uh, if you zoom into that even further, you find chromosomes. You can zoom into that even further and find, find within your DNA, uh, within those long stretches of DNA, these genes. Um, and so what is a gene? A gene is is basically a, a long stretch of of what we call nucleic acid so those are just just you can think of them as chemicals but the the key here is that there's four of them um four only four chemicals amino or uh, nucleic acids and we label them with these letters g t c and a and what those mean isn't really important it's just to know that they're different and it basically, they make this long code that, in, that is like the instruction manual. It's the blueprints for how uh, proteins get encoded. Um, so that's gonna be kind of the ba bare bones basics about what everyone in our program looks at. We all look at some form of genetics, which is gonna relate to these bottom codes. 
Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, uh, so this is the the like central dogma, the the main holy grail of of biology, um, how how we all orient ourselves. So you have your DNA, your basic genes, and from them through that comp through that long code, you get a complicated series of chemical reactions, and you get your proteins, and then through a whole another complicated set of combinations and folding you get your traits or your phenotypes and so these are the things that you actually can can detect so you have you know five fingers or maybe your hair color or how straight your hair is or something like that all of those are phenotypes or traits and uh i'm gonna go a little bit into what i've been doing which is studying these worms so on the bottom right corner you can see these little tiny microscopic worms so a full adult is only about a one millimeter big barely fits in between your fingernails. Um, and what I study is this specific gene that we call the dumpy gene. And when you have a, 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 mis, a mutated gene or a, a slightly misfolded dumpy protein, these worms, they look much smaller and much wider. So they shrink in size and they get pretty large and they move a lot slower than the, uh, the regular worms with the normal functioning dumpy. So I actually have some of these worms right here and I was gonna, they're like on these little plates, basically, that's, this is how they grow. And uh, you can see the bacteria on there, that's what they eat. And I'm gonna actually take you guys over to my uh, microscope and show you guys a little bit about what they look like. And so this is my, this is my microscope. I spend several hours a day on there, it's tons of fun. <laughs> and uh, sometimes it takes me a couple minutes to um, find one of these things, but hopefully I can, zoom in and show you guys a little better. Um, just give me a second. And so it looks like there's one of them now. Zoom in. So this is a dumpy worm. And you can see he's not even really moving at all. Um, yeah, you guys can see that. So yeah, that's that's a dumpy worm. There is also a non-dumpy worm on here, but they're a little bit harder to find. And so if you give me five seconds, I can find it. This one is going to be your non-dumpy worm. And you can see he's moving much faster. He's hard to even keep on the plate because he's moving so fast. Let's see if we can keep track of him. So there he is slithering across there and he's just doing his thing, moving right along. So yeah, that's a little bit about what I look at, what I, what I do most of the days. And uh, I will uh, go ahead and leave, leave the worms alone for now and uh, jump to the next thing. So a little bit about why this is important, I guess, right? So, so why do I look at worms? So the main thing is, is I can use these worms as almost models, as like examples of how these genes work. Because a lot of these worms share very similar genes as you and I, as, as every human. And uh, you know you can track these dream these genes throughout their generations and, and the traits associated with the genes if they, if they can be tracked in the in the same like generations, the same children that get born. Um, then you can you can really tell what gene is associated with like a certain disease. So diseases are just going to be you know a, another type of phenotype. Um, so I have an example of of a you know a kind of Punnett square, a, a certain form of inheritance, and uh, this is this is with the dumpy gene. Um, so uh, the capital D Y. And the, is going to be the the non-dumpy version of the gene, and the lowercase dy is going to be your dumpy version. And the main point of this Punnett square is to address to show you guys the uh, difference between dominant and recessive genes. So the the dumpy version is going to be a recessive trait, whereas the non-dumpy version is going to be a dominant trait. So if you have like a kind of cross like this, where you have four, say say it's four children, which are in these four squares. You can have the uh, the uh, 
three that have D, the capital DYs, those are all going to be normal functioning, normal moving worms. And you can see down in the bottom, you have two videos. The one on the bottom right, it is a video. It is moving, even though it doesn't look like it's moving very fast, but it's definitely moving because um, it's the one that is going to be dumpy. So it has two lowercase DYs and it is has that recessive trait. So that's just one form of inheritance. And I'm going to kick it back to Dr. Brooks. She's going to talk about another form. Fantastic. Thank you, Luke. So um, my name is Dr. Brooks. And if you all want to switch to my camera so you can see me instead of my slide just for a minute, um, I told you I work with large uh, animals, mostly large mammals, and I brought a friend here today to help. This is Mr. Patty. Patty is a young horse who's in our UF uh, teaching program. So in terms of his development, he's actually about the same age as a middle school student. So if he starts acting up, we'll know why, right? Uh, so Patty is special because he has a trait that is a great example of another type of inheritance called incomplete dominance. So let me step back here so you can see Mr. Patty showing off his handsome coat color. He has a coat color called Palomino, which is the result of an allele that we call cream. So the non-cream version of that allele looks like this. This is Miss Reba. Miss Reba is a spicy redhead, true to her name, of course, but without that trait, this is the coat color you would see, a nice, deep, rich orange. She was a little bit of trouble this morning, so she stayed in the stall. We make one change in the genome, and we get this lovely yellow color, just like Patty right here. If you change two copies, it looks even different. So if it were dominant, one copy and two copies would look the same. But in this case, two copies looks different. So let's go back to my slide just for a second and I'll show you what the Punnett square looks like. Let me bring my slide back up. I'm gonna shut the door on little Reba here before she causes some trouble. So um, here's our Punnett square and in an incompletely dominant trait, two copies has almost twice the phenotype. So this particular allele just dilutes his coat color from that lovely orange to this pretty golden color. And he's a little bleached out because it's Florida and he's got his long winter coat. If he had two copies, they call them cream and they look just like vanilla ice cream. They are very, very light in color. So it's sort of like one allele plus two alleles makes double the effect. That's how you can remember your incomplete dominance. So if you're thinking about your modes of inheritance, you can remember Patty, he's going to be camera shy now. He says, no, I don't think I'm going to, don't think I'm going to talk to the students. <laughs> I use genetics to study all sorts of traits in horses, including body size, behavior, and even some diseases. And there are some diseases that horses get due to genetics that people also get. And horses are big diurnal mammals. They're awake during the day and uh, they get a lot of things like some diabetes, things, conditions similar to diabetes in people. So they are also an excellent model for doing science. All right, so let's see what other kind of traits we can investigate. I'm going to turn you over now to another member of our team. Try that again. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Hollister, and as Dr. Brooks said earlier, I'm the academic program specialist, so I help support our graduate students in the genetics and genomics program. And so we're actually going to take a little do a little activity um, with you right now. We're gonna assess what traits you may have. And so we have three examples of three different traits here. And so the first one over here to the, um, to the left is the hitchhiker's thumb. And so the hitchhiker's thumb is a thumb that bends backwards like mine, if you can see in the camera there, I have the hitchhiker's thumb. The second trait over to the right is attached versus detached earlobes. And so detached earlobes are not connected to your face, but like mine are detached, but attached earlobes are connected to your face. And then the last trait is the widow's peak hairline. So if you have a widow's peak like I do, you have a V here instead of a straight across hairline. 
And so for the next uh, 30 seconds or so, either take a mirror or work with a partner to try to figure out which of these traits do you have? Do you have the dominant trait or the recessive trait for each of these traits? All right, so if you didn't finish, that's okay. We're not gonna be able to discuss the results from your class today, but we're gonna send your teachers an activity so that they can discuss the results to see which traits are more common among your classmates or which are more rare among your classmates. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure to send a follow-up to your teachers so you can learn a little bit more about those traits. Oops, excuse me. Um, so right now we're going to switch gears just a little bit and talk more about why should we care about all this genetic stuff. So what's what's happening with research right now at UF, um, some of the things that are happening, and why should you care about this? So I'm going to turn it over to one of our graduate students, another one of our graduate students, Paul. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Wassel, and I use genetics to study a specific archaea uh, called Halopharyx volcanium. Uh, are here actually a third domain of life. And uh, the picture here depicts actually the power of archaea and where they can live. Um, that plant you see actually has uh, salt buildup on it and the water around it is extremely salty. You would think nothing could live there with all that salt, especially building up on the dead plant that you see. But actually archaea are able to thrive in these extreme environments. And Specifically, Halopharyx volcanii has a red pigmentation. Therefore, there's that red color in that water that almost gives it kind of a pinkish hue. Uh, it creates some really beautiful scenery. And you can see this across nature with uh, archaea as well. But, you know, in, in my next slide, I'm going to show um, why do we care about archaea? Um, I guess not only is it because it creates some beautiful environments, but Scientists have also um, studied archaea because they kind of fall in between bacteria and eukaryotes when it comes to their genetic information. So archaea are actually um, more similar to eukaryotes than bacteria like E. coli or something that you may have heard of, um, strep. Um, if you get strep throat, it's actually a bacteria. So um, archaea are kind of the middle ground between that and eukaryotes, eukaryotes being plants, humans, ourselves, um, funguses, um, all kinds of things like that. And so it creates a simpler organism that we can use uh, to study the uh, eukaryotes, which are us, humans and plants. So how do archaea survive in extreme conditions? Well, on the left side here, you can see two different proteins. And if you imagine that the one on the left is, let's say, a human protein, and the one on the right is an archaeal protein. Um, just using this as an example, the archaeal protein has differences. As you can see, it's smaller and a little bit in a different shape to then survive in these extreme conditions. But what that causes as well, interesting, interestingly enough, um, is um, archaeal proteins can actually not function in normal environments. So archaea couldn't really survive, for example, Halopharyx volcani, I can't survive unless it's in those high salt conditions, which creates an interesting balance because as you can see on the right in this deep sea thermal vent, there's actually a ton of archaea that live around these vents in these very cold, deep, dark ocean environments. And, but they couldn't survive on the surface of the ocean. So it's extremely interesting the balance between how their genes encode these proteins that then are able to function in these extreme environments, but aren't able to function in just normal conditions that we all can survive in. So life is an extreme balance of the two. And it's, it's really cool to learn more about how all these things can survive in these conditions. Um, so next time you're out in nature, if you're out looking at a, you know, pond in the middle of, you know, where you don't really see any life, 
really think about what the microscopic organisms are in there and really think about how beautiful some of these organisms can make. Because these are all archaeal environments here. And a lot of the color you see is actually because of the little microorganisms that are found in all of these areas. So uh, now I'm going to pass it over to Sadine, who's going to talk a little bit more about uh, kind of what we use genetics for in humans, as well as a little bit about COVID-19. So, Sadine. Thank you, Paul. I love the video that you had there. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sadine, and I use genetics at the neurosurgery department to help kids with uh, brain cancer both to know what type of cancer they have as well as try to help them to treat uh, that cancer. Uh, like um, Luke and Dr. Brooks said, unique uh, traits can help us be uh, unique uh, and differentiate between um, each other and other um, species. Viruses use that to differentiate the uh, protein that they have on the surface. So I have an example here, which is everyone have heard about it. It's the COVID-19 virus or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It has a, a lipid shell, which is fat-like uh, structure and a protein that is um, that looks like a crown, hence we know the name um, uh, coronavirus. And it has a, a genetic code inside, which is the nucleic acid, and it's a RNA. And the way it goes in is if we have someone infected or we touch a place that is infected, then we uh, get back to our eyes, nose, and mouth, as everyone knows. But the main organ that is infected is the lungs, and that's why people um, would have difficulty in breathing um, in some cases in severe cases. And the way to avoid that, as you all know, is to wash our hands, put masks on, and stay six feet apart to help ourselves and our families as well. So the way the virus goes in, after it goes into lungs, it has a key and lock mechanism. So it, if the key on the um, uh, surface of the virus matched a lock on the cells, this is our own cells, host cell, they can inject their uh, nucleic acid, which is the genetic code inside the cell and signal to the cell to make more of that virus at the bottom uh, part of the screen. And then when it's ready to go out, it signals to the cell to die and uh, rupture or burst and then release the new viruses. Um, and this is how we transfer uh, the infection from one person to another. So what we can do as scientists and geneticists is to work on uh, the mRNA of the spike protein. So this is not the virus. We're working on a vaccine here in the uh, University of Florida and all around the world. There are a lot of people that are working and I myself took it um, two weeks ago. Um, so what we do is we make it in the lab without the virus. It's a, just a signal which is called the messenger RNA inside a lipid. You, we took it to the engineering department and geneticists there help us make it. And we inject it just in the shoulder, just like any other vaccine. And what it helps us is it sends a signal to the cells to make proteins that are similar to the virus. And after these proteins are um, in the body, there comes the general of the army, I like to call it, it's called the antigen presenting cells or the APCs, present these proteins to the T helper cells. And the T helper cells, what they do, which are the immune cells in the body, they're the connection between the general of the army and the army. And they shout out the signal. They tell every cell that, hey, there's a foreign body, which is the virus that's gonna come in after a few days, few weeks, few months, be careful. So the blue side of the army, which is the B cells, they generate antibodies to block that protein from attaching to the cells. And the gray cells, they basically engulf and eat the viruses. For that, we use a lot of um, uh, technology and we have a lot of collaborators. We have people, geneticists from the 
um, a vet uh, veterinary medicine school. We have a vet oncologists. We have pediatric oncologists. We have AI and engineering neurosurgeons. We have bioinformatics as well as um, uh, scientists from uh, the neurosurgery department. And by that, I take it to uh, Franio to tell you more how to become a scientist. Hello, everyone. My name is Franjo and I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm a PhD student in genetics and genomics at the University of Florida. I work in the field of psychiatric and statistical genetics. I study genetic causes of Tourette syndrome and OCD. But today I'll talk to you about what it takes to become a scientist and how can you become one. I will focus on careers in genetics in particular because genetics is the coolest. You become a geneticist by going to school. First, you'll finish high school, then college, then you'll do some graduate school, like master's degree or a PhD degree. So you must wonder, what kind of people can become scientists? Well, anyone, everyone, all of you, as long as you want to. All you need to have is curiosity, creativity, and persistence. Straight A's are not a must, but they do not hurt. Geneticists do all kinds of things, and you can find your comfort zone. Some geneticists spend time in a lab. They study different kinds of organisms and their DNA. Some of us work with human cells and human DNA. Some of us work with animals, such as horses, flies, worms, or mice. Some of us work with different types of plants, like flowers and trees. And some of us study single cell organisms, such as bacteria and archaea. Some geneticists work in a hospital. Here, for example, we can track how patients react to certain medication and then look at their DNA and figure out if their DNA, in fact, affects how they respond to the medication. Some physicians become medical geneticists and then they look after patients who have genetic disorders. Some of us enjoy computers, math, and statistics. So we become computational and statistical geneticists. And all the work we do is on a computer, analyzing tons and tons of data. Some geneticists enjoy teaching, so they become teachers in high schools and colleges. You can spend your time studying different animals in their natural habitats, like ecological geneticists. Or you can study different organisms over the time of Earth's history, like Ice Age, like evolutionary geneticists. You can even study space stuff. Genetics is the coolest. But no matter what kind of genetics you do, all of us love to get together around the world with other geneticists and share the science. Hi everyone, and thank you for watching my little animation. My name is Franjo, and please make sure to ask all the questions you have about how to become a geneticist and what do geneticists do. All right, bye. Hello, Fantastic. Well, thanks to Franjo for sending the animation. He's actually in class this morning, but we'll get to see him this afternoon. I hope you all have enjoyed our virtual field trip of all the amazing, well, not all the amazing things, but a sampling of the things that we do at the UF Genetics Institute. We have more than 220 faculty, all using genetics to study various different exciting things about science and biology, like my friend Patty here. <laughs> if you have any questions, we'll be happy to try to answer what we can today, or you can reach out to us through email or phone. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Brooks, and thank you all so much for your amazing presentations. We actually have gotten quite a bit of questions, um, and I'm actually going to start with you, Dr. Brooks. Our first question for you is, isn't it really challenging to be an expert on the genetics on so many different types of large animals? 
<laughs> you know, it is tough. Um, I really, I specialize a lot on horses, so that helps. Um, they're a little easier than some of the other organisms I work on, like camels and some specific gazelles, um, because they're domesticated. And so we tend to have them around and it's, it's a little bit easier to work with our equine science program here to come out and look at different traits in these horses, like their height and their color. Um, the fun thing about genetics, though, is that lots of things have DNA. So if you learn how DNA works, you can then uh, be able to um, better understand how it works in most organisms. And some of the genes that we have in, the, in horses actually do very similar things in people. So it's easy to carry these things over. So I have collaborative projects in honeybees, screech owls, and even some shrimp. So once you know DNA, you can do a lot of stuff. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Our next question is for Dr. Hollister. I had a student write in and say, hi, my name is Alex and I'm in fourth grade. And they said, um, is it good or bad if I have more dominant or recessive traits? Hi, Alex. Um, so it's actually neither. So it's not good or bad, it's just dominant or recessive. We say that because as Luke was talking about, um, if you have like one copy or two copies, of a dominant trait, that means that you see that trait when you look at your phenotype or your physical appearance. And so a recessive one or a recessive trait just means that you have to have those two copies in order to be able to see that trait in your physical appearance. And so it's not good or bad, it's just well, how many copies of that uh, trait variant or genetic variant do we have? So yeah, either one is okay. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Sadine. Um, we have a question from Melody that says, does the coronavirus have a lysogenic cycle like chickenpox virus? Can it lay dormant in the cell or does it have more of a lytic cycle? I love that question. I think it's a graduate student question more than a middle school question. So, um, and it, the, the cool thing about the coronavirus is once it gets in, um, it shows an effect, uh, whether it's, um, whether it's um, um, latent or no, that's yeah, too early to um, um, mention. Uh, but what, what I can say is that once it goes in, there is no latency or a lag that we see. Uh, but the nice thing is that um, some people are symptomatic, some people are not symptomatic. Uh, that's the only difference that we can uh, get and we do that we do uh, know by doing a pcr uh, reaction and test the patients and see if they have it or no but that's a great question thank you and our last question this morning is going to um for luke and one student's asking what do you hope to find by looking at worms uh that's a pretty loaded question. I guess I uh, there, there's there's really like kind of two kinds of the main research questions. There's like I, uh, targeted questions and like discovery based questions. So really, what I was looking for was any gene associated with a specific phenotype with a certain disease. I have I have these worms that uh, you know they're pretty sickly. They they don't do they don't live as longer. They don't not able to handle as much stress and I wanted to figure out what genes are responsible for for causing that state and so I have you know dozens and dozens of experiments that I run to tease apart what specific gene is causing this this kind of sickly state. Thank you Luke and thank you all for teaching us so much about, uh, this morning about genetics we really appreciate your time uh, again taking the time out of your schedule to be here with us. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie to wrap things up. Thanks, Brian. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today on this exciting call to learn more about genetics from a variety of different uh, scientists at the University of Florida's Genetics Institute. You can learn more about the free programming scientist in every Florida school has uh, by visiting our website and our social media, um, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, and Twitter. So teachers, we encourage you to request an individual scientist visit for your classroom by clicking the link we put in the chat box. And we'll be back today with this great genetics program and team again at 2.30 p.m. today, should you wish to join with another classroom 
We look forward to bringing you more live stream as well. On January 26th, we'll be back at 10.30 and 2.30 p.m. to talk about plate tectonics. So we will see you later today or next time. Have a great day, everybody, and bye-bye.